Welcome to Season 4, Episode 10 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm going to be talking with Dan Tricarico about creating focus, simplicity, and tranquility in the classroom. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript, links to recommended resources, and to share your thoughts on the show. So I've invited Dan Tricarico as my guest today. He's a high school English teacher in California and the author of two books, the most recent being The Zen Teacher, Creating Focus, Simplicity, and Tranquility in the Classroom. Now, you can imagine with a book title like that, I was sure Dan and I would have a ton of things in common, and I was so fortunate to get to spend time talking to him at a conference last year in New Jersey where we were both speaking. So I just loved everything about Dan's energy from the moment that I met him, and I think that you'll find that his sincerity and his humility just shine through in everything that he says and does. So for me, Dan is just the real deal. He has so much wisdom to share with his fellow educators. So thank you, Dan, for agreeing to be a guest on the show. I'm just so honored to have you here and to have you speak some truth into the hearts of teachers. Thank you, Angela. I really appreciate you thinking of me. It's such a pleasure to be here. So tell us what you mean by the term Zen and what that has to do with being a teacher in your classroom practice. But Zen is not a religious term in the way that you use it, right? No, it's not, actually. I know it comes from Zen Buddhism, which is a religion, but I think uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be religious, especially if you think of it as a philosophy or a life approach, which is exactly what I'm talking about in the book. Uh, Zen just, um, and I'm going to give you the definition that I use in my book, Zen is when you notice your life exactly as it is, free from judgment and with detachment from anticipated outcomes. That's Zen, when you can just look at um, things that happen in your life and accept them as they are, uh, that's Zen. I I work with a teacher whose favorite saying is, and I'm sure you've heard this, it is what it is. And I I think he just says that because he doesn't know what else to say sometimes, but I think (laughs) he doesn't realize how Zen he's being. And that's exactly, I always uh, love when he says that because it is what it is, that's Zen. Mm, I like that. It is what it is, right. So one of the qualities of a Zen teacher that you talk about in your book is intuition. And I'd love to hear you share more about that because it's a message that I'm really passionate about too. I feel like far too many teachers are just not allowed to trust their own professional judgment. And so they kind of forget how to follow their instincts as professionals. So how can a teacher tap into his or her intuition? Well, first of all, I totally agree with you that it's very important that teachers do this. And I think we've kind of earned it, frankly. If you spend any time teaching, uh, you have a professional judgment that comes into play and... um, You know, you just, you know when your class needs to change. You know when the next lesson needs to change. You know when uh, anything in your teaching practice needs some adjustment. And uh, we really have to learn to trust those little voices and little hunches and the gut reactions we have uh, when we feel that, especially as teachers, because everything we do is so important. And as you say, there's so much at stake. And I think um, one of the things I would ask teachers to keep in mind is that it's about stillness and it's about finding silence. And I just wrote a blog post called Intuition Doesn't Scream, which is actually, um, I I said it uh, sort of serendipitously at a workshop I was doing, a Zen teacher workshop. We were talking about intuition and I said, yeah, intuition doesn't scream. And that really resonated with me because, um, you know, the, the voices that we hear and the instincts that we have and the impulses that we have when we're making decisions and that are trying to inform us are very quiet and they just kind of whisper and whether you call it um, uh, your conscience or intuition or messages from the universe or leadings from God or whatever your faith based uh, system is um, you know it's never a loud kind of thing so I would encourage teachers to find times and places where they can be still where they can be silent and kind of tune into that frequency of listening to the intuition and asking yourself, okay, you know, I'm struggling with this situation or I'm struggling with this student or my peer or whatever it is, and or I want to make a positive change, uh, what should I do? And then be quiet and listen. And um, I think the thing to keep in mind about uh, intuition is that uh, whether you do it through meditation or prayer or both, uh, intuition is usually right 
It wants to help you. It wants to help you be positive and do what's right. And it's a muscle that can be exercised and built and toned. And it's a skill and it just takes practice. But we need to learn to trust it. And again, uh, like I said, as teachers, I think we've really earned it if we've spent any time at all in the classroom. Uh, If we listen to those voices, we'll know what to do. I love that idea of it being like a muscle that you can Mm -hmm. train because it is really hard to do it first. And I think it's especially hard when you're just used to having this constant noise and constant stimulation, you know, and all the sensory input we have, we have our phones ringing, we have the TV on, it's just, it's so hard to get silence. And, um, you know, what you're saying really rings true to me, because I find that a lot of times when I'm mulling over a problem, the answer comes to me when I'm going for a walk, that's like my main place or a bike ride working in the yard. I mean, even just sometimes, you know, in the shower, anytime when I'm not being constantly, you know, having all this input coming at me, um, can you can you say more about that, about why how teachers can get this silence when it's just such a noisy, busy world? Well, it, it absolutely is. Um, I even um, was uh, doing a poem. Today. It was the first day of school today. And um, I did a poem by Pablo Neruda. And you would think on the first day of school I would be talking about how to be motivated and get work done and, and uh, make things happen. And, and, of course, that's important. But I found this poem. Um, it's called Keeping Quiet. And um, uh, mm. There's a a great line uh, uh, in it, and it says, let's stop for one second and not move our arms so much. And I just love the specificity of that. As as you said, we are in a society where we are constantly glued to our phones, constantly glued to the Internet or Netflix, or there's just a million things going on. And the, the thing I think that we need to keep in mind is all of those things are a choice. And it may not seem that way sometimes. It, you know, I have to do this. I have to do that. But they're a choice. And, and you know what? Silence and stillness is a choice too. And frankly, it's a choice we don't make. And that was the message to my students today is I said, how many of you take time for stillness? How many of, of you take time to be quiet and be still? And um, some of them raised their hands. But I think in general as a society, we don't. And certainly I know educators are very giving people and they go, 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 always, you know, on, always doing. I always say teaching could be a 24-7 job if we let it. But I think um, we need to remember that it's a choice to stop. It's a choice to slow down. It's a choice to say, no, I don't want to be on that committee. I can't be the advisor of that club. You know, it doesn't mean don't give. It doesn't mean don't do your job. But it means you also need to carve out white space on the calendar for you to be able to um, power down and uh, decompress and be silent. So you can not only recharge, but listen to that intuition you're talking about. I like that you found a a practical way to bring that into your classroom, even from the first day of school. That's that's really awesome. I mean, obviously, the first key to a Zen classroom is for the teacher to practice these kinds of traits and habits and to bring right. that energy to the classroom. But how does a teacher change the classroom energy through these kinds of things? You know, a lot of times, it can feel like the kids are bringing chaos into the classroom, maybe from the community mm-hmm. outside, or, you know, maybe the school culture itself is just chaotic. So how can a teacher create tranquility in the classroom under those circumstances? Um, my niche is helping teachers. And everybody always asks me, well, how do you bring it into the classroom and how can I do this with students? And I I kind of am focusing right now on teachers, but here's what I will tell you is I always say Zen starts with you, meaning the teacher. And parents know this. You know that um, your child's behavior is greatly influenced by your rhythm and your energy. And if your child falls, for example, they look up at you like, should I be hurt by this? And they're waiting for your reaction to see, you know, should I cry? Mm. Should I be hurt? Mm -hmm. And if you're calm, then they're calm. And the same thing is true in the classroom. If the superintendent walks in the room and you get nervous, the kids are probably going to think, well, maybe we should be nervous about this. You know, this is a, you know, he looks kind of nervous. Um, you know, you probably shouldn't be on Facebook or Pandora when the superintendent walks in, <laughs> but you can still be relaxed and calm and, and, you know, show the students that, hey, this is natural and it's okay and I'm not bothered by this. And if they say that you're not bothered, it just creates a, um, a vibe in the classroom that kind of permeates and is kind of um, contagious. Yeah, I I have to agree with that 100%. I think I I really liked what you said at the beginning, too, where you're saying, you know, so much of of talk about education reform and and improving teaching and learning is focused on the kids. And that's great. But we really do. I think in some ways, teachers just kind of get pushed to the side. It's like, wait a second, the teacher is the one who creates the whole energy of the classroom. Like, we have to take care of teachers, we have to nurture our teachers, it can't 
all be about just giving, giving, giving to the students. Who is taking care of the teacher? So that's just Absolutely. such a powerful message. Well, thank you. And, you know, it's funny, a uh, real short story here. Um, Dave Burgess, who published my book, and I'm eternally grateful for, to, to him for doing that. Um, you know, I was I was writing my blog, and, and he kind of stopped me, and he said, you know, I think we're kind of getting off message here because I was getting very militant about what you're talking about, about how teachers should be taken care of and nobody's taking care of teachers. And he said, you know, you might want to think about this. You don't want to, you know, turn people off or offend people. And I said, okay, I get that. And I thought about it and I, and I called him back and I said, Dave, I think I have it. And he said, what do you, what do you mean? And I said, well, I've been writing about how, t you know, mad I am that teachers aren't being taken care of. And what I finally realized is, I'm just going to take care of teachers. Hmm. And, and that that's, and he said, absolutely perfect. That's the distinction. And so what I hope to do with the book and the workshops and everything that I'm, and the blog and everything that I'm doing is I want to be the one to take care of teachers because I don't see it coming from anywhere else. And we don't have the support we need in terms of um, uh, spiritual health, mental health, um, uh, stress reduction, any of that coming from, from site, from district, from state. I mean, it's just not there. As you said, the teachers are getting pushed aside. So I want to be that advocate for teachers. I want to help teachers with the techniques that I'm talking about and say, hey, you deserve to have some peace in the classroom. And, and yes, it starts with you. Right. You deserve it. And on top of that, you actually have the power to create it. Yes. Which is just, absolutely. I mean, that's just such an empowering thought, right? You don't have to wait for no. someone else to grant you permission. Absolutely not. Pick yourself. Pick yourself mm -hmm. and make it happen. But again, it's choice. And it, and it takes some courage because um, I talk about... Um, intentional and radical self-care and mm -hmm. uh, the radical the intentional part means it's a choice and the radical part means it's out of the status quo it's not normal nobody's going to come up to me and go you know what dan why don't you take a nap you know nobody's going to say that <laughs> so i have to be the one who makes that happen and guess what you're going to ruffle feathers people are going to look at your funny why does he get to do that i don't get to do that and, you know, you just have to say, because I'm worth it and because I value my, my time and my peace and my state of mind. And, and um, I, I think you're absolutely right. It has to come from within us. And we do have the power to do it. One of the qualities that you talk about that I think is related to this self-care um, in, in the Zen Teacher book is about loving kindness. Mm -hmm. um, and I just I love that, that that was included. Can you tell me more about what loving kindness and what compassion look like to you? Why are these qualities so important? I, I was actually very eager to discuss this with you when I saw the question because um, tomorrow is the second day of school and I'm going to be trying something very bold in the way that I introduce the idea of loving kindness in the classroom. Um, uh, for years I did like every other teacher did in the first day I went over my syllabus and the class procedures and the rules and the expectations and all of that and I stopped doing that several years ago but um, I realized that I want to try and, and, and just give them one rule which is, and, and I may not be the only person who's ever done this, but I'm just going to say, be kind. And then that's going to be the only rule. But then I'm going to break it down and say, there, there are several categories. Be kind to me. Be kind to each other. Be kind to the stuff in the classroom. And perhaps most importantly, be kind to yourself. And I want to mm -hmm. see how that goes. And I want, it, I want it to be that streamlined, that zen, that personal, that basic. And, and I think that if I trust and have the faith that if I give that idea to them, just be kind to, to, to all of those categories, we should be covered. And we'll see. Um, you know, I think that, that from a teacher standpoint, um, you know, loving kindness is also about recognizing the humanity of our students, even the ones who aren't our favorites. And having empathy and compassion for them. And I often say that if I have 40 students in the classroom, which I, I typically do now crazily, um, mm -hmm. I try to remember that if there are 40 students, there are 40 stories and all of them are different. And that helps me be kind and, and have empathy for them is because everybody's going through something and I have no idea what it is. So sometimes it's even a wonder that they care about commas or quadratic equations or whatever or the Magna Carta, or whatever it is. I mean, they're just going through su such um, crazy and outrageous things at home with boyfriends, with girlfriends, with family, with, you know, everything you can health. I mean, um, you know, just so just having that in mind, and when you see somebody 
who's not totally there instead of just coming down on them or hammering them about it, you know, say, what are you going through? Another thing about loving kindness and compassion is I heard this, I, I, I don't tell my students this because I'm not citing my source, but I can't remember where I heard it. The question is that you ask is what is the most generous assumption I can make about this person? Oh, and that's if, so good. Mm -hmm. If you approach it like that, you, you just develop this incredible empathy. And related to that, it's kind of funny. I know when um, uh, it, it used to be when uh, we would be driving along in the car and somebody would cut us off, my wife would say, well, I'm sure they're going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, just mm -hmm. that most generous assumption that you can make, um, yeah. you know, gives you empathy. I love that. What is the most generous assumption I can make? I'm so using that in every aspect oh. of my life. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah, I, it, it's changed the way I look at things when, whenever mm. I heard it, wherever I heard it. I think I was so blown away, I forgot to make a note of where I heard about it because it is so powerful. Mm -hmm. Another really powerful idea that, they, that you've tapped into is um, the Zen philosophy of, of detachment and mm -hmm. acceptance. And that's something that I've tried to address a little bit, like letting go, like detaching from... Um, the outcome of students' test scores and, and trying to yes. you know keep from being so stressed out about that. But the question that I feel like I get a lot from teachers is how how are you supposed to accept things that are unacceptable, and how do you detach from situations that are really important when there's really a whole lot at stake and what's happening is not okay? Um, how how do you how do you accept something that's not acceptable? I think that's a great question, and there, as you said, there is so much at stake. And, and actually, I can cite my source on this idea. Um, I remember reading Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and he talked about the circle of influence. There are things that we have control over and things we don't have control over. And as caring people, teachers often obsess about uh, lots of things they have no control over, and that's kind of a waste of energy. I mean, it, it's not fair and it's not right, and, and we don't like it, but you know, it's a waste of our energy. So where we need to put that energy is into the things that we can control and that are within our cir circle of influence. And that's the stuff in the classroom, how we design a lesson, how we choose to react to a student in the classroom. And um, one concept that I've been uh, refining and thinking about over the last year is I used to talk about balance and balance is important. But then I heard somebody talking about the idea of harmony. And harmony is different than balance. Balance, you know, we talk about work-life balance. I want, you know, that I kind of get the impression like I want this much life and this much work and I want it to be even Stephen and, you know, like the, the lady with the scales of justice. And, and it, that's, that's not realistic. Right. Um, things are going to be out of whack sometimes. So this other person I heard about, and again, now I, I can't remember this uh, citation, but they talked about harmony where even if things are out of whack, if you are – dealing with things the best you can within your circle of influence, being true to who you are and the choices you're making to be the best you you can be, things will at least be in harmony. And you can know you've done your best. And I think that makes it easier to let go. Um, you know, I know I went into the classroom thinking I was going to save every single student. And learning that I wasn't was a very hard lesson. And I, I think on the other hand, well, gosh, how arrogant is that to think that I'm going to go in and, and just save everybody. And <laughs> so what I've come to expect, and not expect, but just kind of have faith in and trust is that if I have a really good relationship with a student and I'm mentoring that, that student and I'm sort of influencing that student and we have this wonderful connection, that's great. And you know what? That happens with every teacher and every teacher can say that. But there are other students that I don't have that with and they might be struggling and I have to say, okay, I don't have that kind of relationship with that student, but you know what? Some other teacher will. And I let that go. And I say, okay, you need to connect with somebody else. And, and I'm sorry I'm not your guy, but you know it's not working here. And I need to trust that you're going to find somebody else. Now, that doesn't mean you ignore that person or you don't try to help them. But we all know that there are those special students that we really click with and that we've really developed this bond with. And you know, um, there's a, a marketer guy I follow, and he says, feed what works. And I think um, that's very true there is we have to spend our energy within that circle of influence where we can make the biggest difference and let everything else go. Yeah, and I, I, I really like what you said about thinking about how that child who maybe, maybe you didn't get to reach that one child, but someone else still can. 
You know, it's yes. not all on your shoulders. You are not the last teacher this child is ever going to have, you <laughs> right. know, it's not all on you to save them, you know, in, in the 10 months that you have them in your classroom. Um, you know, you don't stop trying. But you know, I think that does kind of let you detach a little bit from, from, from the outcome, because we can't control the outcome. No, we can't. And you have to, um, you know, reach out as much as you can, but then, you know, acknowledge that you aren't, you aren't going to be that person for everybody. And you have to be okay with that and, mm -hmm. and say, I tried and, and have that faith that they're going to connect with somebody else. Mm -hmm. So as we wrap up, Dan, what's something that you wish every single teacher knew about creating focus and simplicity and tranquility in the classroom? I think the thing that I would like to leave teachers with that I wish they knew is I wish they knew it was easy. Uh, I wish they knew they could do it. As we talked about, it's their choice and they have the power to do it. They just need to choose themselves that it's important and value it. But mainly, I wish they knew how important it was to reduce the stress in education uh, so that they can make it through their career and continue to do the great work they're doing in the classroom because we really, really need them. And uh, there's so many great teachers out there, and I'll just share quickly. Uh, the reason I started this is because I had 10 years to go until retirement, now nine, and I was watching these amazing teachers burn out and melt down and leave the profession, and I said, I can't do that. I have to find some way. And uh, again, there was so much that was out of my control, out of my circle of influence, and that so much was at stake with my job, my career, the students, um, how I felt in some ways with the, the testing machine that was out of control and the huge class sizes that we were just totally going in the wrong direction and that I couldn't change that at all. I thought, well, you know what? I In this room, actually where I'm sitting right now, uh, looking at these 40 empty desks, I'm like, I can make a difference here so I'm going to focus my energy here and choose to value what's happening here and let everybody else uh, figure out all that other stuff. But I wish teachers knew that they had that power and that they would take it because we need them. Hmm. Dan, you're such an amazing guest. I could talk to you all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This has been fun. I could talk to you too. If teachers want to learn more from you, where should they go? Oh, man, there are a ton of ways to take part in the Zen Teacher Conversation. I'm just going to just Great. kind of blast you here. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a website at www.thezenteacher.com where I have my blog. You can sign up for a newsletter. I don't get it out as much as I would like, but it, it is periodic, and it has activities, and it has articles, and it has resources for you. Um, I am on Twitter at, at the Zen Teacher. Um, and I have a lot of fun with that. I mean, it's just amazing in this world that we can have such uh, amazing professional development among teachers. I've learned so much from teachers uh, such as yourself around the country. Um, I have a Facebook page. And I also have a closed group that people can join. Just uh, find the, the uh, Facebook closed group for the Zen Teacher make a request and I'll approve you. Um, and always happy to hear from people. Uh, my email is teachingzen at gmail.com. So those are all the ways that you can kind of take part in this and, and help me uh, to figure this out and, and to share with other teachers this in incredibly important message of self-care and focus, simplicity and peace. That's awesome. So I always close out the show with something that I call the takeaway truth. It's this mm -hmm. short but powerful sentence or quote that I want teachers to remember in the week ahead. Can you give us a takeaway truth for this week? Sure. Um, I've got a great one, I think. Uh, a couple years ago, the yearbook uh, staff sent out a, um, an email, a Google form, because you know we don't get enough Google forms in our email boxes. <laughs> and um, it said, uh, I, I wish my students... If, if my students could learn anything from me, I wish it would be, and then we were to fill in the blank. And I put in, I, I wish they would learn that they were okay as they are. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the same message I want to leave teachers with is you're okay as you are. Um, we, we think I'm not enough. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I don't have enough. I, you know, I can't do enough. But I think what we really need to start saying is I'm good enough as I am and I'm okay as I am. And if you start with that, everything else just moves in a positive direction. So just say to yourself as an affirmation, I'm okay as I am. That's so beautiful, Dan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And thanks to all of you for listening. Have a great week. And remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it. Truth for Teachers is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. 
podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. For more great podcast recommendations, go to edupodcastnetwork.com. That's E-D-U podcastnetwork.com.